So I have um, a tough task today because I am uh, uh, replacing uh, Joseph de Vries, who uh, was very much looking forward uh, to, to this conference, but who could not uh, join us. Uh, but he's uh, asked me to convey uh, a message to all of you that I uh, show here. So he, uh, yes, he uh, regrets uh, not being able to uh, come, um, but sends, sends his uh, greetings. He notes that, uh, well, polarons have been uh, for a long time an integral part of many condensed matter conferences, including uh, the very first EPS-CMD that was uh, organized in, in, in Antwerpen a while ago. Uh, then, well, he's happy that polarons have really taken off, and as we will hear this week, are now present in many different areas of, of physics. Uh, and finally, he wishes us a very uh, pleasant uh, meeting. But yes, as I said, I now have a difficult and, and almost impossible talk to, to give, to give a review of uh, so much work that was going on, I cannot possibly do justice to, to all of it. But um, the plan for the talk will be, uh, will be as follows, nevertheless. Let's start with some uh, overview of the, let's say, the traditional polaron, the electron in a bath of uh, phonons, um, which will be mostly a historical uh, a review of, of what, what happened. Um, and then I will turn to uh, polaronic effects in a broader sense, in, in, in other systems, uh, giving four examples out of many that could be chosen. Two of those, the Bose polaron and the angulon, will also feature uh, prominently in this, in this conference. And then uh, hopefully I will have some time left to tell you about uh, what happens when we have more than one uh, a polaron uh, present. So, but before we start on this program, and because now we are also on YouTube, so maybe for an even broader audience, I should maybe start with uh, reminding us and, and our viewers of what is a polaron. And for that, I'm uh, going to use a, a simple cartoon that, that many of you know, but that was uh, that's actually based on uh, of the first reference I could find for this cartoon was. Uh, a uh, uh, inaugural speech given by Josef de Vreze when he uh, started in Eindhoven. He got a second uh, professorship there. And so this, uh, this cartoon reminds us of, of well, how the Polaron was, was introduced by Landau back in 1933 um, as something related to well, a lattice of ions or, or, or a polar lattice into which an electron is being introduced. And then, of course, these different ions will uh, interact differently with this, with this electron. The negative ions will be repelled, the positive ones attracted, and this will lead to a deformation of the lattice. And so, um, this uh, electron taken together with the deformation, this quasi-particle is then what, what was called the polaron. There's, um, in general, two categories of, of polarons, depending on whether this object is much larger than the lattice spacing or much smaller than the lattice spacing. So, if it's, so this is, of course, then the large polaron or the small uh, polaron. So here's another uh, uh, cartoon uh, about this. So this is a conference, uh, a physics conference, and pretty much like this one with the reception. And then all of a sudden, Einstein walks in. You see him here. And so he's uh, immediately surrounded by a cloud of, uh, of uh, fans. And this will, of course, change the properties of Einstein. He will not be able to move in the same way through the room as he would through an empty room. And so basically, this change of properties, the fact that we no longer have the original band carrier, is going to be the main question that we want to answer in, in, in polaron physics. So what is the binding energy and the effective mass of this quasi-particle? And then, of course, in order to probe it, how is it going to respond to uh, external uh, perturbations, to uh, electric fields, what will be the mobility, and to electromagnetic fields, what will be the optical absorption? All right. So now let's, let's, uh, let's start, and I will start with the uh, large uh, polarons. So for, this, for these large polarons, we can do a continuum approximation, and uh, Froehlich was the first to 
derive a field theoretic Hamiltonian uh, for this, um, which is given here. So here you have this uh, uh, band mass uh, continuum approximation for the kinetic energy of the impurity or the electron. The phonon bath, which actually we will take to be simply longitudinal optical phonon, so it will be a constant frequency that can be taken out of the sum. And then the interaction between the electron and the phonons, where the electron can uh, either emit or absorb uh, a phonon with a given uh, interaction amplitude that's fully characterized by uh, a single number, a dimensionless coupling constant uh, that depends on the band mass, these frequencies, and the ratio of high frequency to low frequency dielectric constants. So this is a very, actually a very uh, simple model. It's a, uh, uh, let's say, oversimplification uh, from what you would have in, in any realistic material, where you have, of course, more complicated bands, uh, more than one band, you have uh, several phonon bands, and then also the electron-phonon interaction can be more uh, complicated. And many of the talks that we will hear this week will be exactly on trying to make a more, much more realistic uh, Hamiltonian for, for our uh, polaron, um, with input from ab initio to start to get the, the, for an actual material the correct uh, description of the band structures and the interaction, the electron phonon interaction, and of course also from experiment with lots of interesting materials where we can try and extract these, these quantities also. But for this uh, review talk uh, for the large polaron, we will stick to this, to this uh, simple model representation. Now, these, the, the properties uh, will depend sometimes quite strongly on this coupling uh, strength. As you can see here, for the effective mass for the acoustic polaron, there is clearly a, a weak coupling regime for small alpha that's different from a strong coupling regime. And many of the early works for, for the polaron were also looking at these two separate uh, regimes, so coming from the two limiting uh, cases. So, Expansions uh, were made for uh, small coupling, perturbation expansions, but also there were a bunch of then work studying uh, the opposite limit, the large alpha expansions. And here, uh, what you can see is, uh, let's say, the, the state-of-the-art values for these, these coefficients of, of the expansion. Um, and a big question that then, then appeared was how to bridge this gap between the strong and weak uh, coupling regimes. And to discuss that, that I will um, go from, from the uh, energy and effective mass towards the uh, optical absorption, which is a, something that, that Joseph de Vrezen has uh, contributed uh, uh, a, lot, a lot in. And so we'll start with the weak coupling optical absorption, where the elementary scattering process is, is shown here. So you have a polaron absorbing a, a photon and being scattered to a final state while emitting a, a phonon in the process. And so the first um, uh, expressions for the optical absorption were derived by Gurevich, Lang, and Firsov for low temperatures, and again, as I said, for, for weak coupling. So this was done in two limits, a limit where you have, uh, let's say, a single impurity, not worrying about any of the other impurities, where you can see this optical absorption is uh, at, at larger frequencies going as one over frequency to the five halves uh, power law, and then the other limit is the high density limit, so you have a very large, uh, the Fermi energy is the largest scale, and there this uh, decay at large frequency will go like 1 over omega uh, squared. Uh, there's also, uh, at temperature zero, there is a, a, a gap. You need at least one LO phonon uh, energy before the absorption can, can set in. So that's the picture at uh, weak. Uh, coupling, you have this uh, wide uh, absorption band. At strong coupling, there was another uh, paradigm to, 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 to study this. Um, at strong coupling, of course, then the, the self-induced uh, potential by the electron is much stronger, much deeper, and may have some uh, bound states in it, where the uh, 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 electronic part of the polar on wave function can be uh, confined by this, by this uh, uh, potential form a bound state, the ground state. But now you can think of making an uh, 
excitation to a higher electronic state, so from an S uh, state to a P state, for example. Uh, of course, in that case, the uh, lattice potential that we have here is no longer the good one. This has been relaxed for a polaron in its ground state. And so you can uh, think that, well, with relaxation, you will have a different potential here. And so the actual uh, excited state that one considers is this uh, so-called relaxed excited state. And so for the uh, um, strong coupling polaron, the, idea, the, the optical absorption was then thought of as transitions between these different states where this, uh, this transition, the one between the, the ground state and the relaxed excited state, was, uh, let's say, the most prominent uh, one. And so once you have uh, calculated what the energies are for the various uh, states, then you can think of the spectrum as some sort of uh, spectral lines at, at strong coupling. And then, of course, there's the question how to reconcile these two limits, just as there is the question of how to reconcile them for the energy and the band mass. And their experiment uh, cannot, cannot uh, help us because uh, no known solid has the very high Fehrlich coupling constants where we would expect these, these very sharp peaks to, to appear. In practice, this is limited to, to alpha 2 or 3 in, in these materials where this would be more something like alpha 10 uh, for this. So how to bridge the gap between those two uh, studies, the two, two limits that were the first subject of study? That came with uh, Feynman's uh, treatment. Uh, and that's a, a path integral treatment. So what, what one uh, calculates there is uh, the density matrix. Or, of course, if you have the density matrix, you have the partition sum, and then you have the free energy of the system. And it's calculated uh, as a sum over uh, all paths in imaginary time, uh, weighed by the exponent of minus the action of the system. And the action for the Fröhlich Lagrangian, there the uh, phonons appear as a, a quadratic field, so they can be integrated out uh, analytically. And if you integrate them out analytically, what you are left with is a uh, interaction between uh, the electron and itself at a different time. So this is a, a retarded interaction. And there is also this term, which is kind of a, a forgetting memory effect. So if, if these two times are very far apart, then this uh, retarded Coulomb interaction will be exponentially suppressed. So that's, that's uh, very nice that you can eliminate the phonons, but then w still with this action functional, you cannot solve the path integral uh, for, for, for this object for the, the density matrix. And so the, the brilliant uh, idea of, of Feynman was to uh, then find a variational solution to this, to this problem, where the variation is not the one that you are used to from, uh, let's say, grandfather quantum mechanics, where the, you use a variational wave function and then adapt the parameters of the wave function, but it will be uh, this time a variational action functional, um, that you need, and, and the requirement is that you can calculate expectation values with respect to this uh, variational model uh, system. And then you have an upper bound for the free energy of, of the system. So the trial action which was chosen by Feynman consists of our electron mass connected via spring to a large phonon mass. So it's a very simple Hamiltonian. Uh, it's again quadratic now in this, this big mass representing the, the, the phonons. So you could choose to, to integrate out again the phonons. You'd again obtain a retarded interaction, which now would be quadratic rather than uh, Coulombic. But the simple Hamiltonian allows you also to calculate all the expectation values that you need for this free energy. And so you do get then an uh, upper bound for the free energy, which is uh, shown here. Uh, as the full line as a function of the coupling strength. And you see the weak coupling uh, result is this dotted line, the strong coupling result is the, the dashed line. And uh, this, you see it's a very good uh, result that you get. It's, it was, it's the state of the art result for the Fröhlich uh, polaron, this, this uh, path integral treatment. So that's for the energy, but now let me come back to the optical absorption, because there, um, De Vrees and, and his co-workers back in 72 were 
uh, instrumental in uh, finding, in using this uh, Feynman variational model to derive a, a formula for the, for the optical absorption uh, relying on, on, on the memory function. And uh, here you see the results for this. So here's the absorption as a function of, of frequency. And you see the weak coupling result. You find it back as this, this black line here. But then as you start uh, raising the coupling strength, you see that this develops into a sharp uh, peak, which would be this relaxed, excited state that I mentioned uh, before. Now, already in this uh, paper, it was, uh, it was noted that if you would keep on increasing this alpha, you would make it very large, up to 10 or something like that, then this, this peak would simply get sharper and sharper and sharper. And that's not something what we would expect, because this relaxed, excited state will have a finite lifetime. And so it must have uh, a finite width. <laughs> Nevertheless, this... this uh, a theory of optical absorption remained the standard for 30 years for trying to identify the presence of large polarons in uh, materials. It was only in uh, 2003 when a diagrammatic Monte Carlo uh, was applied to the polaron problem that uh, things, things, we got, we, things changed. So we'll hear about this diagrammatic Monte Carlo and, and modern implementations uh, or more modern implementations uh, of this uh, also at, at, at this conference. Um, so uh, what do we see here? This, this is the, the optical absorption. The full line is again the result that, that, uh, from the analytic formula and the, the circles are the diagrammatic Monte Carlo result. For weak coupling, everything is all right, but indeed, if you go to stronger coupling, then this uh, very sharp peak gets uh, broadened out and gets, gets not so, not so uh, high. So this, um, this is about the width of the peak, because if you compare the location of the relaxed excited state peak uh, between the two theories, then these locations match uh, really very well for, for uh, this uh, entire uh, range of alphas going even to very large uh, alphas in, in, in the system. So um, this has, uh, of course, now spurned a lot of uh, uh, theoretical work to try and think of how to improve on, on this uh, formalism and what were the missing uh, ingredients. And the first uh, missing ingredients or, or improvement turns out to be uh, that in the Feynman model system, you only have actually one frequency that's present for, for this excitation. Whereas, uh, well, that would be good if you think of this, this self-induced confinement potential. The bottom is parabolic and maybe you, you can think of it as one frequency. But as you go out to the edges, it's no longer parabolic. So one frequency would, would be bad. And so there was an extension uh, of, of the Feynman model system to non-parabolic uh, trial actions which turned out to be uh, the needed improvement at, uh, let's say, intermediate uh, uh, coupling. So here you see the results. The, the blue line is, again, the, the original uh, theoretical result, and the, the dots or the symbols are the diagrammatic Monte Carlo. And now the, with this improvement, you can see this black line is, is much closer to the numerical results. The other ingredient is that in calculating many of these uh, 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 correlation functions that go into this memory function formalism, an adiabatic approximation was made. And uh, if you uh, let go of this adiabatic uh, approximation, then you find that this is a correction which is uh, needed at the very uh, strong uh, values of, of coupling. So again, here there's many curves, but ju just compare the uh, symbols to the, the red dashed curve, which uh, uh, is, is uh, taking into account these non-adiabatic tra transitions. Note that here, there is this relaxed excited state peak at, at very strong alpha is certainly not the prominent fi feature anymore. It's, it's more this sideband, this Frank Compton sideband, which is sideband, which is now uh, important. But again, um, so this, you may say, this is a nice game for, uh, for uh, theorists um, because in practice, if you keep on increasing alpha, then the radius of the polaron will start to shrink and shrink and shrink, and you will go outside of the regime of validity of this continuum approximation for the, for the Frelich uh, polaron. Uh, 
And what you need then is um, another model, the, the Holstein uh, model for the uh, small uh, polarum. So there you see now we have for the kinetic energy this hopping uh, term. Um, but again, there is just a single uh, phonon frequency and then uh, electrons can emit or absorb a, phonons, uh, a phonon on site uh, for, for this. Again, this is very much a uh, uh, oversimplified model that we use to, to get to grips with how a small polaron will behave qualitatively. Uh, and, and a lot of the talks that we will hear will be about uh, also improving this Hamiltonian, making it more complicated, making it more suitable for realistic materials using, using ab initio uh, work. And another direction that we will hear of uh, during this week, uh, I think, is how to bridge the gap between the, those two Hamiltonians. So if we go from small to large polarons, what, what, what will happen uh, in between these model systems? All right, so these uh, small uh, polarons, how, how do they behave? Uh, it turns out that, that there are several regimes for transport for these small polarons. At the lowest temperatures, so below the phonon temperatures, then you can think of, of these as uh, very heavy particles in, in a narrow band, but still moving coherently. Uh, at a very high temperature, then, of course, you're going to uh, dissociate the electron from, from the phonons. But at the temperatures which matter, uh, around room temperatures, then you will have uh, activated uh, hopping sets in. You will have this uh, thermally activated behavior. And this is actually uh, something which is used to identify the presence of small polarons in, in several uh, materials. So we will hear about titanium dioxide uh, this week. But... Um, uh, the picture that I show here is from uranium dioxide, where Joseph has done uh, some work even back in the 60s on, on this material, when he was still working in, uh, in our uh, nuclear science uh, center in, in, in Belgium, uranium then being important. So that's for, let's say, the DC, uh, the DC conductivity. If you look at the frequency dependent, a conductivity, then uh, what, what you find is that there's no longer this uh, power law decay of the absorption as you go to higher frequencies. It now becomes an exponential, uh, an exponential decay. Um, and uh, again here, this, this, uh, can be, uh, this uh, optical absorption can be used uh, to compare with experiments and detect the presence of small polarons in, in these materials. Of course, in the experiments, you do not have many decades worth of this uh, decaying lines. You cannot really check whether it's exponential or, or power law with, with, with a lot of, uh, lot of uh, certainty. So in this uh, context, let me uh, uh, again um, mention a little, like a sneak preview, maybe this, uh, this will be talked about. This is work of, of uh, Cesare and Georg and, 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 and Van der Walle, who are all, all here, and their co-workers. Uh, where sometimes from the experiment you get mixed uh, signals. Uh, some response properties may indicate that you have small polarons, and other response properties may indicate that you have large polarons. And so it turns out that the solutions to this, to this uh, uh, conundrum is that uh, in some materials they can uh, coexist. So this was uh, shown in, 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 in uh, this uh, paper that the energy difference is really very small and the small polarons can be transfer, transferred and become uh, delocalized. All right, so that's what I wanted to say for, let's say, the single polarons in their traditional setting of an, an uh, electron interacting with the phonons. But uh, a development that has taken place is that this uh, polaronic uh, uh, physics is now taking hold in many different systems uh, outside of the, the original electron and, and, and phonon part. And there's four examples that I want to go over with you that are uh, listed here. So let me, let me start with the first one, the Riplonic polaron, which um, is... Uh, an object that occurs in, in the study of electrons on helium. So if you have a, a helium uh, 
liquid at the bottom of some experimental cell, and you have a discharge producing electrons. Then these electrons are drawn towards the helium uh, surface, uh, attracted to their image charge, even if it is a weak one, but they cannot penetrate in the liquid helium. Uh, there's a one electron volt barrier preventing them from doing that. So they're stuck at the surface. They're anchored to the surface, so they cannot move trans, uh, away from it, but they can move parallel to it. And this system, this is an experimental system that many researchers have used to study the physics of the two-dimensional electron gas in the two-dimensional electron system, where an anode is uh, often put in to play with this density of electrons, to tune the density of electrons. Um, there's a polaronic effect in this system, uh, that you can see because this uh, electron, so it's uh, attracted, there's an electric field pulling it towards the anode. And so when there is a wave in the helium that comes by, this electron will be pushed up and down in this wave, and then you have a displacement in a force field giving you an energy, which here is the interaction energy. So uh, what's left to do is then to quantize these waves on the helium surface. They're called uh, riplons, and they have their particular dispersion. And in this system, they will play the role of the phonons uh, f that, that was for the, the traditional setting. Then there's the uh, uh, electron riplon interaction, which, once you quantize the riplons, again is a process where the electron can emit or absorb a, uh, a riplon. So we have, in effect, again, a fairly Hamiltonian here. There's one, one more uh, thing here, which is the lattice potential for the electrons. Very often, the density of electrons is really low in this system. So you have a Wigner solid of electrons in this system. So it's a bit the reverse. Now the phonons are not, uh, do not have an underlying lattice, but the electrons will uh, have, have an underlying uh, lattice. So this was uh, studied also with the goal of trying to reach a strong electron riplon coupling by increasing the electric field uh, that the electrons experience. But it turns out to, there turns out to be a problem in this system. When the electric field is quite strong, then the helium surface is no longer stable. It starts to buckle, and you pinch off a little bubble uh, that goes inside the liquid, and in this bubble there are uh, electrons. These electrons do not fill the volume of the bubble, Rather, they are still, because the bubble is quite large, you see it can be uh, even in, in, into the visible, uh, naked eye visible range. But these electrons collect uh, at the surface of the bubble, forming a thin layer, again anchored to the surface. And so one of the things that, that, that is predicted for these bubbles is that if you keep increasing the, the pressure, means you squeeze the bubble, this is a way of increasing the uh, electron riplon interaction strength, here you would have a transition from an electron liquid towards a, a solid of polarons, a lattice of polarons. The polarons themselves would then be in a regime where the system wants to, to solidify. So, but there, so the, 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 the work to uh, stabilize these multi electron bubbles is still, is still going on, so this is still an, an unconfirmed uh, prediction. The second example uh, is one that will uh, feature quite prominently in, 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 this, in this, uh, this week, uh, is the, uh, an, an impurity in an uh, ultra-cold atomic uh, gas. So the system then is uh, this little blob of, of, of uh, here it's uh, sodium uh, atoms, which are suspended in a magneto-optic trap. Uh, and that can be cooled down to temperatures of tens or hundreds of, of nanokelvins. And at, at first sight, the uh, Hamiltonian doesn't look at all like the Froehlich Hamiltonian for this system. So you have a Bose gas, an interacting Bose gas, where, where here we have the interatomic uh, interaction between the bosonic atoms. And then you can introduce uh, an impurity uh, atom. And you have, an, uh, again, an interatomic interaction between the impurity and uh, the bosonic uh, uh, atoms. Now, but what happens if, if, if you cool down this system, then below a certain temperature, uh, this Bose gas will form a Bose-Einstein condensa uh, Bose condensate. So here you see some uh, 
typical pictures that people show when they have an atomic condensate. This is a velocity distribution, which is Maxwellian above DC, and then you see a sharp peak arising of the single mode that is becoming macroscopically occupied by uh, many uh, uh, bosons. So then the relevant degrees of freedom uh, will be, well, on the one hand you have the condensate itself, the atoms in the macroscopic mode, and on top of that you have the Bogoljubov excitations uh, of, of above the condensate. And so if you do the Bogoljubov transformation uh, to describe this, then it turns out that this Hamiltonian that you had turns into this form where now it's the Bogoljubov excitations of the condensate that take on the role of the phonons, and again, the interaction is one where the impurity can emit or absorb one of these Bogolubov excitations. So you have a Fröhlich like uh, Hamiltonian here. And this was um, uh, very uh, exciting to us at the start because there is an interesting experimental knob that you can turn in this system. Namely, you can play with the interatomic interaction string. The, one that, the, 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 the thing that's relevant is the S wave scattering length. And there are some uh, scattering resonances when uh, the energy of the scattering state is equal to the energy of a bound state in a closed channel. Then the scattering length shows this divergent feature and you can boost the scattering length. If you can boost the scattering length, then uh, you can boost uh, the coupling constant, the, the Fröhlich coupling constant. And in, indeed, there's some, then, then some, some, some theoretical predictions saying that this distinction between the weak coupling and strong coupling regimes would also be present for this impurity in a Bose condensate. Here, for example, you have the effective mass as a function of alpha, and you really see that there is a weak coupling regime which will transit here into a strong coupling uh, uh, value for the mass. Also, in the response properties, uh, there are some familiar traces. So now, of course, you have to know that these impurities and these atoms are neutral. So we don't have the optical absorption anymore. Uh, we have to go to Bragg scattering. We have to, uh, uh, because that is what, what, what we can do only with the, the neutral atoms. But also there now we expect that strong coupling, that there are traces of this relaxed excited state. And so this was a really uh, promising system, we thought, to uh, open up this, this strong coupling, the large alpha regime, because our phonons here are no longer part of a lattice. So there is no uh, polaron that is smaller or larger than the lattice uh, constant. There is no lattice constant anymore. But then uh, nature always turns out to be uh, more surprising than that. Um, and this, this, uh, both polarons were realized in, in two uh, seminal like, experiments, and we're uh, very happy to have Jan Arlt at this conference who will tell us uh, uh, probably more about, about this. Uh, it turns out that our Fröhlich description is only valid in a small uh, corner away, far away from this Feschbach resonance. And if you get closer to the Feschbach resonance, then, then it's, it, it doesn't work anymore. And it, it turned out that, that processes that go beyond the original Fröhlich model then need to be taken into account. In particular, uh, you have vertices that will now couple the impurity to two phonons at the same time, so that's a new kind of vertex. But then also, uh, there's, uh, in, in solids we're used to have our electron couple to uh, free phonons, uh, but here we have to also take into account negative bound energy states uh, of, of the boson and, and the impurity. So uh, let me just mention a few, a few additional uh, cold gas experiments. There's now also experiments with Rydberg atoms that we will hear of in this uh, conference uh, by, by uh, Schmidt. And uh, there has been a measurement of the polaron mass by the group of uh, Obertaler. And, f and well, of course, once the experiment tells you that the original theory is wrong, there, has, there is this, this spurs a lot of new uh, theory and I hope we will also hear about these developments uh, at, at this, at this uh, conference. <coughs> Finally, to conclude my cold atom part, uh, another uh, item which, which uh, I think will appear at this conference is the Fermi polaron, where you put an impurity in a spin polarized gas of fermions and then wonder how these, these uh, uh, one fermion will now 
try to pair up with one of the many other uh, uh, pairs. Okay, this was my second example of polaron polaronic effects outside of their original uh, setting. Third example, for that we go back in time again, uh, reminding ourselves that what we needed for the original polaron is actually uh, not as much a, a, the, the, the atom displacements, but it's the polarization that goes along with it. So uh, any other mechanism, uh, any other source of polarization in a material can also lead to polaronic effects. And one of them is the, uh, the electronic uh, polaron, maybe nowadays we would call it the exciton polaron, where the source of polarization are the, the excitons, so bound electron hole pairs that can now uh, start to dress these, these electrons. And this is actually uh, uh, something which uh, also Josef looked at again uh, a long while ago, and which was uh, found to be present in materials such as uh, potassium uh, chloride. Right, the fourth example uh, is, again, a, a little preview of what we will hear at this conference. It's a really nice, uh, uh, out-of-the-box way of, of thinking about uh, polarons, where up till now, we always think of, of linking the, or, of, or we think of the impurity as having as degree of freedom, its translational degree of freedom, the uh, linear momentum. But of course, your impurities can be more complicated objects with some internal structure. So it could be a molecule that, that has rotational degrees of freedom, and you could think of your bath of bosons coupled to, a, uh, uh, to the angular momentum of the impurity. So we'll have, uh, we'll have a session uh, on these, uh, on these uh, so-called angulons also uh, at, our, at our conference. And they are, they are uh, um, relevant, for example, if you think of molecules in tiny helium droplets. Uh, where these rotational degrees of freedoms can be, can be accessed. All right, then up till now, of course, now I've only discussed the physics of a single polaron, a single uh, impurity. Um, but except maybe for this molecule in a helium droplet, it's in practice very hard to have a system where you just have one impurity or where you have a really low density of impurities. In practice, you will always be in an environment where you have many of these impurities or, or, or electrons sitting around. And then you have to think of how to take that into account. So then if we turn now back to our large polaron, fairly Hamiltonian, now we have, of course, many impurities and they are uh, interacting here, for example, through a, a, a Coulomb uh, uh, interaction. Um, but for the rest, they have, the, let's say, the standard, the electron phonon coupling that, that, that is present. So how to treat this? There was a, a, there's a very nice work by Lemmens, de Vries, and Brosens, where they found a neat trick uh, to take into account these interactions between these electrons, between these polarons. It's, uh, enough to look at the system without the, phon the phonons and to think of uh, or to calculate what is the structure factor of this interacting electron gas. And that you can take from your, your favorite many body theory or from experimental measurements, but what you need as ingredient is the structure factor. And then what was shown is that um, if you work out this problem, at least in weak and intermediate coupling, so not in strong coupling, but in weak coupling, then the uh, original formulas that you get for, uh, for example, the energy are modified in a very simple way. The mass is modified to a mass. It gets a factor of the structure factor, much like a Feynman -Bell, uh, the Feynman-Bell relation for, for helium. Uh, this is also true for the optical absorption. There we have the old formula, but also here, all the effects of this, this uh, uh, many-body interaction between the impurities or between the electrons are contained in the structure factor of, of the material. If you would go back to the limit of a single impurity, then the structure factor becomes very simple. It's just a delta function. And if you plug that in, then indeed you see that you get back this weak coupling uh, result for the optical absorption. So this was, um, this was uh, used. So what's, what's the main effect of, of this having many impurities is that 
uh, the non-interacting peak gets, gets suppressed. And you also have some feature where that is representative for uh, mixed phonon plasmon uh, uh, modes. And if you want to compare again to uh, the optical absorption in materials, it's important to take this finite density into account. Here you can see in a neodymium cuprate uh, an example where clearly there's a polaron band. But if you would simply use the one polaron result, then, then it would not be such a nice fit as if you use the many polaron uh, result. Um, it's not always, now I show you a very nice fit. Of course, I have to be honest, it's not always such a nice fit. So here's a more recent uh, example of uh, strontium titanate, where there is uh, a clear match here at certain densities uh, for this uh, 200 uh, milli electron volt band. But in, in, in this work, still the 130 milli electron van, band is a bit of a mystery. I believe that this mystery will somewhat be resolved also at this conference later on. So that's another sneak uh, pre flu that I can give you. Right, so this is for many polarons. Uh, that's maybe a bit too much. So let's go back to two polarons, where these uh, two impurities or two electrons. Uh, can now start sharing their polarization cloud or their, their self-induced confinement uh, potential and um, then uh, form a, a bound uh, two-body state in, in a common potential. This is uh, for the large polaron. For the, the small polaron, this will also happen. Uh, here you can have, in addition to that, if this, this uh, uh, repulsion between the electrons becomes too strongly, you can have a two-center uh, bipolar room appear. Okay, I believe I should probably... Uh, okay. Right, so then, uh, um, what are the uh, ingredients then for these uh, bipolar Um There's the, of course, we still have the electron phonon coupling constant, so we're now looking at the large bipolar ones. Uh, then the uh, Coulomb repulsion between the electrons should be taken into account. Um, and of course, this uh, depends on the ratio of the electric constants, high frequency to low frequency. Those three are not independent, so there's, they are uh, related uh, to each other. But the main question here for these bipolarons is, um, will, will, does, does it exist? Is there really a, a bound state? And for that, you have to compute and compare the energy of the bipolaron with the energy of two separated polarons, if you dissociate the system into two uh, polarons and put them far apart. So to calculate the energy of the bipolarons, we again turn to the Feynman uh, treatment, uh, which then has to be extended uh, from, from, one impurity, from one electron to two electrons. So here's part of a uh, I think a work, a work, old work note of, of uh, Joseph where he uh, sketched the model system. So you have now two copies of this uh, Feynman variational model system linked together with some springs, uh, some additional uh, springs. But again, this is a, a model system that you can compute, where you can compute all the expectation values that you need of and find what is this bipolar on energy. And so that turns out to be a little bit disappointing uh, for the large bipolarons in material. So here's a phase diagram. So here's the Coulomb repulsion strength in dimensionless units. So taking into account this ratio of, of uh, high and, and low frequency, the electric constant. And here's the uh, coupling strength. And you see the polarons for 3D live in this small sliver. For 2D, they live in this small sliver of, of the diagram. Uh, moreover, you need at least a certain minimum strength for this electron phonon coupling to reach there. So it's going, it's going to be very hard in, uh, in solids to find these uh, large bipolar ones. Um, similarly, for the optical absorption of the bipolar room, if you want to identify through comparing it with optical spectra, there we basically have uh, the equivalent of, let's say, the strong coupling theory, where the, you think of the optical absorption as, as a series of transition lines. Uh, and then, well, uh, is this Feynman model really going to be suited for that? This is still an open question. So this, there, there's still a lot of uh, nice open questions on this uh, bipolarons in trying to really find them in materials. As far as I know, large bipolarons haven't been uh, 
found yet, um, in terms of, of theory in trying to, to better characterize them. And of course, as a challenge to all these applications of polarons in other fields or in other contexts, what about bipolarons there? All right, so let me uh, conclude. Um, so the bunch of conclusions, there's some stuff that, that uh, were in the original slides of Joseph that I, I simply didn't come to because I would need another hour and we want to give the word to, to all of you. Um, but let me just note that uh, uh, something uh, very nice is that there exists a set of some rules that you can use uh, on this optical absorption to get out other quantities, so you can get out the effective mass, the polaron mass, also from the optical spectra with, with some sum rules. <coughs> then another uh, open question is the, the, the polaron mobility. There are several theoretical works that, that do not seem to match on the prediction of uh, polaron uh, mobility at, at, at low temperatures. Uh, I mentioned already the multipolaron uh, problem uh, where, where there is still some, some uh, work uh, to do. Finally, some uh, key works for this talk, and I highlighted the book of Alexandrov and, and uh, De Vreze, uh, where you can find a, a, a review, uh, I, th I think at least for polarons in the 20th century. It's a very extensive uh, review. There's been uh, many things uh, happening since, since then uh, that we will hear of uh, here, but uh, up till 2009, it's quite uh, complete. Uh, and I believe it's still being, uh, it's also on the archive, and it's being updated every year to take into account some of these additional developments. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Okay, with this I conclude, and thank you for your uh, attention. There's still so much more in the garden to see. It's, uh, <laughs> In solids, yes. I don't know the references by heart, but there have been studies for this uh, formation time of, of the polaron. Uh, theoretical studies. Uh, I'm not aware of there being experimental probes for that, but that could be my, uh, my, my mistake. Um, let me note that this is also quite interesting for these polarons in other contexts. For example, in the cold gases, uh, how you create the impurities is by you start with the gas of bosons and then you uh, spin flip part of the bosons to another state. They form your impurities. But you immediately measure their energy. So there is a question in, in my mind still unresolved. Uh, is that really going to be the equilibrium polaron uh, property that you are going to measure? Because the, the creation of the impurity there you can really time it, and it, it could be very interesting in this context to find a way to map out this formation of the polaron experimentally. So also there, I think these auxiliary systems are going to help us understand this much better because there's, it's, it's uh, indeed a very interesting question, um, but uh, yeah, I think there, this, these auxiliary systems are going to help us to crack that question. I don't think it has really been uh, solved uh, in, in solids, yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, 
Um, well, what would you like to know about? So, so here the idea is that for the, in the optical absorption, then you have a transfer of energy, but no transfer of momentum. So that is now in, in the Bragg spectroscopy, it's, it's going to be another input parameter. And so um, the uh, relevant energies will be the energies of the Bogolyubov excitation corresponding to the momentum that you transfer. Um, but here we look in, in the very tail, so we look far away for energies much larger than that. And so uh, if we go to very strong coupling, then uh, what, we've, what, what we found in this calculation is that there is an additional peak that appears. And if you would do the, let's say, the strong coupling approximation, the, the PECAR wave function for the uh, impurity in the Bose condensate, and try to estimate where the relaxed excited state would be, then it would be also near these frequencies. So that's why one would attribute it. So to identify it as a relaxed excited state comes from something else, comes from, okay, let's just take this product wave function for the uh, impurity part and then the, the Bogolyubov excitation part, and then we assume that this, uh, for the impurity, is localized. This is variational. We adapt the Bogolyubov excitations to it, and, and then we calculate what, what this strong coupling uh, limit would be. Should relax, yeah. yeah and then the to this, to this, uh, or to the Frank Condon uh, state. So, but in effect, if you look at in the end what, hap so what, uh, what happens, uh, is that in, 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 indeed you would be right. Here you see this relaxed excited state. At very high coupling, this is indeed not so important anymore. But in the, for the intermediate coupling, I, I'm not sure, but I think it would arise as some sort of resonance in the system. Uh, um, no, I don't think you would. You would get it with this born op this is this is here uh, this is also maybe better than saying adiabatic transition this would be the born oppenheimer kind of, of of thinking of this transition so if you would do that then you would miss uh, the the result so you really need to go beyond that it's 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 not enough at strong coupling yeah that's that's one of the things we learned uh, in trying to to compare with diagrammatic monte carlo Uh, by the entire shape, by the entire shape. So um, the DK can al already uh, tell you something. If the peak doesn't, so the, the details of the peak will be influenced by uh, other things such as the density of, of impurities. You see, there, there was a big change there. But whether you are at, uh, independently of the density, this decaying tail can already tell you, uh, give you a hint that there is something. Uh, if uh, but then to get the other results right, then it's what type, uh, what type of, of uh, how many impurities are there, and then this mixing with the f uh, plasmons would also take uh, take place. So I would say both are are necessary. Yeah, yeah, and it's so. This I guess this was. Uh, it's not always easy. I showed you the, the very best picture, right? Because I wanted to show something we're proud of. But it's 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 very often it's it's much more uh, complicated, uh, much more complicated than that to get to get results because also we need then to get input exactly from uh, all of you working on ab initio to get to take into account the correct uh, band structure to get into account the correct phonon structure uh, and and this is actually part of our uh, collaboration and why we started collaborating with 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 our friends in in, in Vienna to. Uh, 
to get much better, much more precise uh, result for this. So this is this is one of, of the results is going to be improving this uh, using the results that 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 we got from from Georg and Cesare. Uh, for the large bipolarons, I do not know of any material in which they have been observed. So I don't think it, there is an observation yet. There could all, yeah, yeah, there exist also these Holstein bipolarons. This uh, maybe I went a little bit uh, fast, but here you can find a uh, uh, prediction. I'm not sure about the experimental observation of them yet. And I'm not, not, not too familiar with that, but maybe some of you know whether the small bipolarons are something that, 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 has, been, that has been observed uh, already. But you see, here for these small bipolarons, you can, um, whereas there will always be, let's say, in, in a common potential for the large bipolaron, for the small bipolarons, they can really be like a little molecule of two that stick together. That are also that are two centered. Uh, what I mean, yeah. Can you think of also another hypothesis? So since you have explored all these many possible type of uh, polarons, uh, so do you expect that the possibility in which you have a kind of a system or a material in which small and large polarons coexist, uh, or other materials or other system in which you might have at the same time electron and Yes, I think I think it does make sense, but I also think that there is a, another nice open question there, in uh, how would it uh, how would it cross over bet between them? If you would have a way to uh, increase alpha or to play with this alpha, can you? Uh, go from large to small continuously, or would there be a regime where you would have a mixture of, of the two, and then some, how this transition occurs is still, is, I think, is still a, a bit of a mystery, but it's certainly conceivable, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 